Adam Smith, famously described in The Wealth of Nations, how everyone is often led by an invisible hand uh, to promote an end, namely the public interest, that was no part of his intention. Uh, in They Meant Well, Government Project Disasters, I describe the other side of that coin. People who, despite worthy motives, end up making things worse, not better, by wasting huge amounts of taxpayers' money on quasi-commercial projects that go wrong. The, the book contains case studies uh, about six projects. The R101 airship, the groundnut scheme, civil nuclear power, Concord, the Channel Tunnel High Speed Rail Link, and the Millennium Dome. The title of the book stems from a conversation long ago with Ralph Harris, the IEA's first general director. He said something about do-gooders, but I had the temerity to correct him. They're not do-gooders, they're only mean-wellers. That's an important distinction. One can't read about these projects, let alone write about them, without admiring the huge efforts of many determined people over a period of years. But especially where there's no competition, the value of the output doesn't depend on the cost of the input. Ministers and officials aren't trying to mess things up. But if government projects turn out to be financial disasters, any resulting technical advances come at huge expense. There may be benefits, but they're outweighed by the costs. Taxpayers' money lost on government project disasters can't then be spent on more worthwhile, profitable projects. The costs of ventures, which depend on new, untried technology, such as the R101 airship or nuclear power, are obviously hard to predict. The frontiers of knowledge are also the frontiers of ignorance. And the promoters of such projects often deliberately put forward initial financial estimates that are far too low. In other words, they tell lies in order to get their projects approved. And for the civil nuclear power programs, the absence of market pressures meant that nobody knew or even cared how much it was all costing. Many of the projects took twice as long to complete as the original estimates and cost taxpayers twice as much. The Channel Tunnel Rail Link still isn't ready as I speak, more than 13 years after the tunnel was opened. None of the projects was well managed. Also, state projects are liable to short-term political interference, which may increase costs, as for the Millennium Dome, or risks, as for the R101 airship. In the market system, uh, a useful rule of thumb is caveat emptor, let the buyer take care. A similar rule of thumb for government might be caveat gubernator, let the government take care. Before politicians decide to embark on a large quasi-commercial project at taxpayers' risk, they should provide convincing answers to two obvious questions. Why won't a profit-seeking private enterprise company undertake this project, if it will let it? But if not, why does the government, in contrast, think the project worth doing? Professor Middleton, why is it that government projects so often go so badly wrong? I think there are two main reasons. Profit-seeking companies are concerned about how a large project's success or failure might affect their profits, dividends and financial gearing all things in which financial markets take a keen interest. In contrast, governments have little incentive to act commercially. Even a large project's impact on either tax or borrowing would be fairly small. And most politicians seem to care mainly about getting re-elected, which no project, however disastrous, would really affect. And the second reason is that even when everyone can see that a project's going wrong and will make a huge loss, it seems to be difficult for governments to admit a failure and abandon it. They're afraid of losing face. That was certainly true both of the groundnut scheme and Concord. If everyone meant well, Professor Middleton, who was to blame for these projects' disasters? Uh, I distinguish the first and the two last projects from the three in the middle. The R101 airship was an unusual and interesting uh, project because it involved a competition between the private enterprise Vickers R100 and the government's R101 airship. But the Secretary of State for Air uh, insisted on the R101 embarking on its demonstration flight uh, before it had completed 
a proper set of airworthiness trials. The Channel Tunnel High Speed Rail Link wasn't supposed to be a government project at all. The Transport Minister said it should be fully commercial, and the treaty ruled out any government subsidies uh, to the rail link to London. But the politicians found a way round that, so that the high speed rail link ended up costing taxpayers about £3,000 million. Finally, the Millennium Dome uh, was a one in a thousand years project, uh, and we shouldn't read too much uh, into it, although it wasn't well managed at all. But I distinguish those three projects, which were each one-offs in their own way, from the projects started soon after the Second World War, the groundnut scheme, civil nuclear power, uh, and Concord. I think what was to blame for all those three disasters was the collective zeitgeist, a sort of post-war glow of overconfidence in government's ability to do anything, combined at that time with a visceral distrust of markets, which I call agoraphobia. All three projects were said to involve national prestige, all were surrounded by a sort of military-style secrecy, and all incurred enormous time and cost overruns. Professor Middleton, how can we avoid such government project disasters in future? At the very least, I think the onus of proof should be on those who want to go ahead with government projects, where there's little reason to think they'll make a genuine profit. Now, I say genuine profit because, for example, the nationalised electricity generators thought they'd be able to pass on to consumers whatever the costs of nuclear power turned out to be. Uh, I also suggest having one or two devil's advocates attached to large government projects to legitimise raising awkward or politically incorrect points in advance. The aim is partly to counter complacency, such as appeared at times with the R101 airship, the groundnut scheme, nuclear power stations, and the, the Millennium Dome. I'd also get these devil's advocates to publish their comments uh, and questions in an attempt to overcome the British government's pathological uh, desire for secrecy. In general, my own solution is simply to let the free market work. Embarking on more large government quasi-commercial projects would be a recipe for further large government disasters. Politicians who lose thousands of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money shouldn't easily be excused on the grounds that they meant well after all, those of us who advocate laissez-faire, which I define simply as government non-interference, we mean well too. Professor Middleton, thank you very much.